20 years ago to the day, the conclusion to quite possibly the greatest cinematic trilogy was released into cinemas. The Lord of the Rings is a story that has resonated with me since the age of five, and as I've gotten older, I've come to appreciate the themes and the ideas of this fantastic story more and more, and my appreciation for it has only grown. The fact that movies that are 20 plus years old can still get an emotional reaction out of me, that's not bad. So to conclude this kind of mini reaction series which I've been doing over the last couple of days to celebrate the 20th anniversary of Lord of the Rings Return of the King we're going to be watching probably my favourite movie in the series. I hope you enjoy. I love that they left something from the first book to be used for the prologue of Return of the King. Because this is arguably also kind of Gollum's movie. It's effectively Gandalf just giving Gollum's backstory from how he was one of the river folk and how, you know, how he found the ring. And just what happened to him over centuries of possession. Seduction of the ring. It's amazing how quickly it ensnares the two of them as well. It's just how quickly they, they, they don't care about anything else. It's only the ring. Just trying to play it off and how quickly it just devolves. I love how brutal this scene is as well. It's, you know, it th this scene does not let up. And it's it's one hell of a way to start to start the film off. And like I mentioned when we were watching Fellowship, you know, the reason why it took so long for Bilbo to be ensnared by the ring well, to to the extent that we see it when he leaves Hobbiton is that his first act was an act of pity it was an act of mercy but Smeagol's first act when he encounters the ring is to kill someone so the ring it it latches onto that and it holds sometimes the work of the author can go beyond what they initially intended and Tolkien, Tolkien doesn't really do allegory, but Gollum is the perfect like representation of addiction. Like you know, you you will become a sewer rat just to get that one that one bit. Ah, oh, that bit always grossed me out. Oh, jeez. You look at this bit and you're like, oh, should this not be, you know, is is this okay? Like, it's like, no, no bed, no, no, no blood, nothing like that. It's, it's like how I, how again I said in, I think it was Two Towers, like, you know, it's, it's fairy tale creepy. Trying to be sneaky, trying not to get caught. He's becoming more and more ensnared. So it's just playing with the ring and... Oh. Wake up. Oh, this was not planned this way. The interactions between these two are fantastic. And it's, you know, this, this, these are two guys who have gone through hell. They're still going through hell. And, you know, Frodo isn't so ensnared by the ring just yet that he's... You know, he he's still more than concerned about Sam. Just the way he's con just the way Sam's concerned about Frodo. And it's, you know two men who have just the the brotherhood between them. And this bit of music it makes you think, you know, their their journey that they're, they're it's they're so tired, but they they're just keep moving and when you know about the 
the cinematography, the music, and how it all blends together, you appreciate it so much more. Oh, chills. Oh, brilliant. What a way to celebrate just feasting and getting high. <laughs> I feel like I'm back at the dream side only. You You've never done a hard day's work. Oh, that's amazing. The fact they cut this scene out is a war crime. I'm, I'm at least happy that Christopher Lee at least knew that these scenes are in the extenders. And that his appearance in The Hobbit was kind of a reconciliation with Peter Jackson. Fought many wars and slain many men, Theoden King. Peace afterwards. I take counsel together as we once did, my old friend. Love how the to all the Tolkienisms in the dialogue is it's here. You answer for the burning of the West Fold. And the children that lie dead there. When you hang from a gibbet for the sport of your own crows, we shall have peace. <laughs> For information, I have some for you. My balls. You cannot think that this ranger will ever sit upon the throne of Gondor. This exile, crept from the shadows, will never be crowned king. This seems fantastic, like demonstrating the power of Saruman's voice. Chris Foley is such a perfect casting. Shoot him. Stick an arrow in his gob. <laughs> just, <laughs> just a slight nudge from Gimli and Legacy's like, yeah, let's do it. Not of Rohan, but a thatched barn where brigands drink in the reek. The brats roll about law with the dogs. Or a lesser son of greater sires. I love how the camera shows Grimer at that point, like, because he knows how much something like that means to Theoden, and that is its main concern of like, I, I can't live up to my forefathers. I still can't believe, you know, we, we know that Christopher Lee has stabbed someone in the back because of these films. And that's like, ah, oh, that man lived such a life. He did like everything. Boom. Oh, the fact that was all cut is, it bewilders me. I can't help but just be happy when I watch these films. Like, they're just... Oh, they're, they're just amazing. Hail the victorious dead. Like, that's the only kind of, I guess, recognition that the elves get, but it's not really given. And, oh, yeah, oh, the... With, with in the theatrical, we missed this in the theatrical cut. It's. <laughs> I can't believe. Uh, again, it doesn't. It doesn't do much for the story, but it's. Ah, uh, it's so good. No, don't drink it. There's a bit of fish floating about in there. Theoden 
Theoden's arc in this film is brilliant. Like he's, you know, he's he's just worried that he won't live up to, you know, his forefathers, and he but but he proves it. He overcomes it. He takes charge of his army. <laughs> the outtakes of this scene are brilliant. Is the dwarves go swimming with little hairy women? <laughs> The outtakes of this are just, you know, just ad-libbing. It's like, I think John Rhys Davies said it's like 90% bollocks. When we drink in our town, you can drink your fancy yells. You can drink and buy the flagon. But the only brew for the brave and true comes from the great dragon. That little interaction between Pippin and Gandalf as well. It's it the the relationship between those two and the journey that those two go on is amazing. Like, you know, Gandalf has lived, you know, what did he say? Three hundred lives of men that he's lived, that he's been on Middle Earth for. And how many Elves, men, dwarves, orcs, as he met in that time. And the one person he chooses to console in Minas Tirith. You know, I'll probably play the scene in its entirety later when we get to it. But, you know, him describing what the other world is like. And, you know, a, a halfling. He chooses to comfort a halfling in what could potentially be their final moments. And that that means an awful lot. You need to quiet down, Gollum. You, like, the, the fact, the fact that Smeagol actually, or that Gollum actually gets somewhere is actually hilarious. He's speaking right out loud and you, you're amazed that Sam goes ballistic. Now, Shelob doesn't answer to Sauron in any way. But Sauron knows that she's there. And he he's more than happy to, to keep her in the Mountains of Shadow. You know, she's a fantastic defense system, basically. And he's more than happy to send a few expendable orcs to her every now and then just to, you know, tide her over. Once the hobbits are dead... <laughs> it's a horrid fat hobbit. It's Smeagol and makes up nasty lies. See, Frodo's... Frodo is a bit of an idiot in this film. Frodo does get a bad rap. And it's like, you know, he... Realistically, he should believe Sam over Gollum. So look, right there. Fucking take your sword out and run him through. That has got to be the most uncomfortable sleeping position ever. He's just there, like, covering her back up, and she just says, I don't mind that you're 87. <laughs> uh, you're an idiot, Pippin. So, it, it, isn't Pippin meant to be, like, you know, like, dangerously curious? I mean, that's what led to, you know, Gandalf's death. I see you. They almost play this kind of like demonic possession. It's kind of amazing how they play it. It's just how terrified he is. Like, imagine, imagine being someone like Pippin. Probably the, you know, most, I don't know, liking of a comfy lifestyle with all the hobbits. And you immediately come face to face with the second most evil thing ever in Arda. Like, that's wild. <laughs> he's an Egypt, but at least he's honest about it. 
It's another great thing as well. It's like, you know, Theoden kind of getting over his pride and realising what has to be done. You're an idiot! <laughs> One thing I've learned about puppets. They are most hardy at first. Foolhardy, maybe. Is it too late? <laughs> Splitting all the hobbits up does give them the best chance at character growth. And, you know, all the different arcs they go through is brilliant characterization. I've forgotten their son's name. Oh, that's really going to bug me now. Uh, is it Aldarion? No. I can't fucking remember. Damn. What is it? Comments, help me out. <laughs> I looked into your face and I saw it. <laughs> Some of the edits for these films are great. It's like it's just the two of them going back and forth. It's like, there is death. There is the life. There is death. There is life. There is death. <laughs> Very bright was that sword when it was made whole again. The light of the sun shone redly in it, and the light of the moon shone cold, and its edge was hard and keen. And Aragorn gave it a new name and called it Anduril. Flame of the West. I love how we're like 40 minutes into the film now, and it's like, right, the introduction's over. <laughs> It's seen better days. And the music reflects that. But as they charge further up the city, it's like, you know, part of the fellowship's here and we're, we're, we're here to help. Don't worry, we're gonna save you. Oh, damn. Just like they did Lego Rivendell, I want them to do... I want them to re-release Lego Helm's Deep, because I missed the chance to get that. I want a Lego Edorus. I want a Lego Minas Tirith. I want it all! I want it all as Lego! <laughs> and how they built the city is fantastic. Basically, they... For those of you who don't know, they built it on top of Helm's Deep. So the set they used for Helm's Deep, they kept the bare bones of it and then expanded it. This set only just fit in one of their warehouses. I'm fairly certain they built in a warehouse. It was like, you know, three stories high and uh, they had to, I think they had to cut holes basically into the side of this massive shed that they built it in and stick lights outside the hole so it would look like sunlight was coming through. He's there like, I don't know, I wasn't there. I was, I, I fell off a cliff fighting a Balrog. Last of a ragged house, long bereft of lordship. Authority has not given to you to deny the return of the king. Steward. <laughs> You're a twat. So I am a little bit disappointed with how they portrayed Denethor in this because he's actually a pretty effective leader in the books. I know what I say it's like, oh, it's utterly ridiculous, the helmets that they've got. <laughs> but now nah, I like it. I like those helmets. I could listen to Ian McKellen talk for hours. Especially when he's talking like this, like Gandalf. Withered. Rule of Gondor was given over to lesser men. Christ, imagine living, like looking at that every day. I'll be like, nah, I'm all right. <laughs> so surely the thing, like, we should do something about this. I think it was this scene where Sir Edmund Hillary. 
the first man to climb Everest came to visit them on set. I'm fairly certain it was it was this scene. And the, <laughs> and the first question that, <laughs> that Sean Astin asked him was like, right, what's the first question I'm going to ask the guy who got to the summit? What was the view like? <laughs> so badass. That helmet is so fucking cool. So this is what I was on about in Fellowship of the Ring. It's like, you know, Aragorn takes him on and sets the Witch King on fire. But you could you can play it off as like, you know, the the Nazgul are stronger the closer they are to Mordor. And it's even I think it's even said in the books that, you know, the Witch King is granted, you know, more demonic power by Sauron. It's it, it's said somewhere. So like he is definitely more buff. Jesus. I've ah I've always loved Minas Morgul's design. Again, Lord of the Rings Conquest, that's a map. And it's brilliant. I think I haven't played um Is it Shadow of War? The second Shadow game? I think you can run about there as like a like a mini area as well. So cool. It is the most sinister war beacon ever. It's like, imagine seeing that in the distance, then being like, ah, oh, we are fucked. Hell yeah. And all of them were given a unique design. None of them were designed to be the same. But at least wait for the army to stop marching by. <laughs> Like, if any of them look slightly to the right and up. So. See, a Saruman could throw fire. Can Gandalf not do that? Just, you know, stand, stand there, just go, nah. And then... I feel so sorry for Faramir because he's here on basically shit detail. Like, Denethor must know it's a bad idea, and they, they, they can give up Osgiliath. Now, I'm just saying, this is meant to be a stealth mission here. And they have lit torches in the dark. Oh, look! A character with a disability who didn't let that define him and got over the troubles that it caused him to lead an entire legion of orcs. Go on! They just, they don't have a chance. They are just so outnumbered. Now, a lot of people in Gondor, much like Rohan, they don't know about hobbits. So imagine if someone looks up to the top of this tower, they just see like a tiny thing crawling up the side of it. So what the fuck is that? Now, Howard Shaw did an absolutely amazing job with the score for these movies. And I can just imagine Peter Jackson going to him and saying like, right, we need a track just to... For the beacons going from Gondor to Rohan, just something simple. And he then proceeds to compose quite possibly the hardest piece of music in this whole trilogy. <laughs> and, ah, uh, the music, it's like, it's... It's Gondor summoning its pride and calling for help at the same time. And just... Ah, oh, it gives me chills every time. Chills for 20 years. He just calls up the hill. Theoden! She's got a sword! (laughs) 
The Nazgul and the Fell Beast, they are just so beautifully evil. It's brilliant. I feel really sorry for this guy. I can't remember his name, but I, th I think it's just because he's nice to Faramir. <laughs> So, this scene and Merry and Pippin first arriving at Minas Tirith, I think, see, because you see them arriving with the city behind them, but then there are other shots where they, like, are coming across, like, from, a, from an angle. So, yeah, like, right here. So, it's like, they were, originally, I think it was meant to be kind of cut across and they intercept. Yeah, so he comes at them at an angle and then curves back round to go into the gate. And that was meant to be the, like, I think that was the original thing that was meant to happen. I can see why they changed it and they edited it this way. But, you know, it, it, it does kind of break continuity a little bit. I want to... Backhand Denethor. See, he's... It, Denethor's a hypocrite. Because Aragorn actually served his father, Ecthelion. Denethor was kind of placed... Like, second best in the eyes of, the, in, in the eyes of his men. So it's like, you know, the fact that he took how he was treated and then pushed that onto his second born. It's like, bro, get out of there. Jesus Christ, the army's still leaving. Uh, how long have they been climbing? And it's still leaving. Oh, no, I'm good. I'm okay. Uh, I don't like heights. I'll be honest. Not a fan. I can forgive Frodo for, like, the switches and everything like that. Because of what he's carrying. And, you know, how close they are to Mordor. And how much it's working on him. Like, he is going to be very susceptible to this kind of thing. But it's that uh, he's... I am slightly pissed that, like I said earlier, Denethor isn't, like... Well, he's shown to be an inept ruler in this. But I do love Gandalf just smacking him one and taking charge. It always made me uncomfortable, these like next couple of scenes, where it's like... You know, it's the perfect, like, Den like, Denethor just chomping down and eating while his men go out to get slain in what is a idea is, you know, it, it, it's also the best way to get around censorship, <laughs> like, censorship barriers. It's like, no blood, he's just eating food. <laughs> but it is, you know, like, perfect representation. Like, you know, he's just there... Not giving a shit. While well, he sends out his men to die needlessly. Oh, just, Sam is sleeping. Right on the edge. Oh, that gives me anxiety. This shot was... Well, this scene, it was shot an entire year apart. There was a flood that hit Queenstown. And they had to build a set for wet weather cover. And the only set they could build was this set here. The the stairs up to up to Kirith Ungol. So they shot Sean. They were only a, a little way into filming. And they immediately jumped in to Return of the King. And they didn't plan on doing anything from the other two movies for a while. And, you know, they, they were scared shitless. Like Sean, Aston and Elijah were that they couldn't get it. Uh, they wouldn't hit the right emotional pitch. Like, the coverage between so Sean when it jumps from Sean to Elijah, it's a year apart. If I was Sam, I would have just quickly got my sword out and just run Gollum through. It was bri brilliant in the actor. The fact that Sean Aston didn't get best supporting actor is a joke. It's proof that the Oscars were a joke even back then.
Even Gandalf's like, this is this is dumb. This is stupid. Why? So brutal. So unnecessary. And yet, a hauntingly beautiful scene. Broken bones, blood and guts, all represented by Denethor's gluttony. Who looks at the top of that cliff and goes, I want to put a campsite up there. Have you guys seen the meme where <laughs> it's like 6,000 spears, less than half? Sir, we found two more spears. 6,002 spears, more than half of what I'd hoped for. <laughs> now this is a scene I want, I want to stress the importance of. He would flee. And he'd be right to do so. Now, a lot of people nowadays would take this scene as like, oh, women can't do war. Oh, my God. It's like, no, back, you know, in medieval times and, you know, when this kind of society would take place. Yeah, war is the province of men. Women, be glad you don't have to do it. War is shit. Like, like you said, it's like, do you think he'd stand and fight when the blood starts running and the screams hit the air? No, war's terrible. Chills again. The moment Aragorn cast aside Strider and goes on the path of the king. I love how long it is. It's such a long sword. Is it you?